It was raining the day Timoth learned how to say goodbye. He was only four, and before that he hadn't had much use for the word. It was just mother, father and his older brother, Petrok, and not one of them strayed too far from the little thatched cottage, the snug barn and the neat garden, all contained within a tumble-down rock wall in a lonely corner of Scotland. Sometimes, mother and father went out the wooden gate to visit the neighboring small village over the hill, and father often went hunting in the forest. But they were always back before nightfall, with lively things to talk about and good things to eat. Well, usually. Not in the past few weeks. Timmet's belly grumbled a lot more lately. Say goodbye, little love. Petrock is going to meet with druids, mother said, holding Timoth up so he could look his older brother in the eye. Patrick was twelve, an unimaginably old age, and he was going off all on his lonesome, with just a ragged brown cloak and some bread tied up in a kerchief. What's a druid? Timoth asked. Mother and father shared a glance, turning to their eldest. Those who speak with the winds and the beasts in the forest, Patrick answered for them. Legend says they are wise and they have many great powers. They will surely help us. He frowned as he looked around the farm, but then he smiled at Timoth. Plus, with me gone, there's more for you to eat. He tickled Timoth, and Timoth laughed and forgot all the frowning and worried looks passing between mother and father. Back for supper? Timoth asked, for no one had ever been gone overnight before. I'll be gone a long time. Patrick told him, but I'll always be thinking about you and looking out for you, even if we're far apart. Timoth leaned out of his mother's arms, and Petro caught him and nuzzled his head. When mother pulled Timoth away again, he clung to his brother, tears filling his eyes. No, Petty! he screeched. Stay! Petro backed up, one step after the other, his eyes pleading for understanding. It's for the best, Tim, he said with a sniffle. Take care of mother and father, yes? No, Timoth wailed. And then Petrock turned and ran through the gate, nearly tripping over his own feet in father's old boots. Timoth tried to run after Petrock, but mother caught him easily and swung him up into her arms and carried him inside and shut the door, securing the big lock that was too high for him to reach. Timoth cried until he collapsed. And then she fed him his mush and tucked him up in his little trundle bed. But he was too upset to sleep, and he heard mother and father murmuring in the big bed from the corner of the room. How will they find the way? mother asked. There are rumors in the village. Fie on the village, father said angrily. What do they know? Haven't seen a druid in three generations. The tall tales grow bigger every year. The forests of Skoskland belong to the druids. If they want him, he'll be found. And if not? Oh, her mother's voice wobbled. If not, we'll never know, will we? There's no future for the boy here. The crops dwindle, the cow's milk has dried up, the chickens aren't lying. When I go hunting, the beasts are hard to find, and sometimes I come across one that's twisted. Wrong. Mother sounded like she might be crying now, but the bed creaked as father drew her close. Look, love, Patrick is a clever lad. If the druids take him in, he has a chance at a better life. That's all we can ever hope for. And what of the wee lad? Mother whispered. But Timoth heard it and wondered if she was talking about him. If it gets worse, when he's twelve, we'll send him out too, Father sighed. Petrov was right. One less mouth to feed. But things will soon appreciate that. Timoth fell asleep to the sound of his mother's soft sobs and his father's murmured promises. He dreamed of a small boy in a big dark forest, running down a path with no beginning and no end. Eight years later. It was a good thing Timoth had learned to say goodbye that day when Petrok left for the forest, because the goodbyes came hard and fast as they grew up. First Alicia, the farm cat, was found nearly inside out. Then the milk cow just fell over one day, light as a dandelion puff, as if she'd been drained of her milk and blood both. Father brought home a brindle dog to help protect the property, but ran away and was never seen again. Grandmother and grandfather, who lived near the village center, died in quick succession, maybe for being old, and maybe from something else. 
No one seemed to know. The dark yes keeps seeping in, mother would sometimes say. My father was sure, sure but he never disagreed. When Timoth was ten, father went out hunting one day and didn't return. Mother went to look for him, and Uncle Joran came down to help her search. But no matter how far they roamed with the lanterns calling his name, they never found hide nor hair of him. Timoth didn't know which would have been worse. The certainty of knowing his father had been killed, or learning he'd left them to venture out alone in search of some place better. Finally, worst of all, mother died when Timoth was nearly twelve. He awoke at dawn to find her in her rocking chair by the fire, her skin gone grey and sunken. She faded away steadily after father disappeared, insubstantial as a ghost. And even though she tried to hide it with extra shawls, Timoth knew she'd been denying herself food so that he would have enough. At least he'd let her kiss his forehead the night before. For all that he felt too old for such things. Her lips had felt like cobwebs. That morning, Tim had buried his mother out behind the barn, and he was surprised at what hard work he was, digging a grave. Standing over her, it felt like a part of his soul had floated off without him, and although he knew he should say something, he didn't know what. Rest in peace, mother, he managed, but felt that it was insufficient. Perhaps he should have gone to the neighboring village, should have let Uncle Joran and what little family was left know what had happened. But in the last few years, Uncle Joran had stopped coming, and Mother had stopped going, making Timoth promise he wouldn't walk the path over the hill. The last time she'd gone, she'd been chased by... something. She wouldn't say what it was, but she never went over that hill again, and Timoth planned on keeping his promise. That day, Timoth drew water from the well, and weeded the gardens and pulled up one puny little carrot. He checked his snares and the fish trap and brought home a scrawny rabbit and a few finger-sized fish. He swept the cottage floor and fell to his knees, crying. He was all that was left, and he was alone. First Petrock, then father, then mother. With each loss, the light and joy had been sucked out of his life until he couldn't remember the last time the sun had truly shone on his face. Sometimes he thought, perhaps Patrock had never existed, that he was just a dream from a better time. Whenever he'd asked mother and father about Patrock, they changed the subject. The only sign of Patrock had ever truly existed was a little carved figure that maybe resembled a spotted dog in the right light. Timoth thought he remembered Patrock giving it to him, but then again, such a thing could have come from anywhere. Later that day, Timoth stood over Mother's grave at sunset, a posy of rag dandelions in his fist. He tied two sticks together to make a rough cross, but it still didn't seem like enough. Mother, he murmured, falling to his knees in the freshly turned dirt. You can't be gone. I can't do this alone. I need help. The world is too hard. He looked up at the sky, at the birds wheeling overhead. Help me! He screamed. The birds flapped away, cawing harshly. Embarrassed by his outburst, Timoth stood and dusted off his knees. He left the posy in the dirt and went inside before darkness fell. The next two years all ran together, dreary and grey, the sun hidden by oppressive clouds from the dawn to dusk. Timoth went through the motions of his daily life, but often found himself standing over mother's grave as if he were half asleep. Each night, he secured a big lock on the door. When he was young, it had seemed impossibly high, but now he could reach it easily. With the door shut, the cottage was snug and warm, and sleep was a welcome oblivion. He no longer rose with the sun. He ate little. Time had lost all meaning. And then one morning, Timoth was awakened by an odd noise. He sat up, blinking his dreams away, uncertain how to proceed. In all his fourteen years, no one had ever come knocking at the cottage door. He slid out of the bed and picked up a big kitchen knife he kept sharp for cleaning fish. There was no way to see who might be outside. Nor was there another exit to the cottage, unless he opened the shutters that had always remained firmly locked over the windows at mother's request. It was always entirely dark within, but the light that shone through the cracks glowed like molten gold. Hello! Timoth barked. Good morning, a voice replied. A fine, mellow voice. Definitely not what Timoth was expecting. What do you want? 
It's good that you are distrustful, said the voice, sounding very reasonable. We live in dangerous times. Are you the man of the house? No, Timothy lied. There are several others in there, or all armed to the teeth. The voice chuckled. Courage, I like that. Will you open the door? What? So you can rob me? Timoth shouted. There's nothing left to take. Has it truly gotten so bad? The voice asked, sounding genuinely concerned. It could not be worse, Timoth admitted, softening just a bit. Because what did he have to lose by telling the truth? Then, it is good that I've come, the voice said. For I'm your brother Patrock. And it just so happens I crossed path with a young heart on my way here. It should feed us both for a while. The breath caught in Timoth's throat. It was simply too good to be true. Patrick has been gone for ten years, he said. Prove that you are he. A fond sigh carried through the door. The day I left, I wore father's old boots. They were too big. I ran away so you wouldn't see me cry. I wanted you to think me brave. Anyone might guess that, Timoth dashed tears out of his eyes. I need more proof. I carved a little dog for you when you were small, the voice said softly. Not particularly well. I sliced my thumb and told you that it was a spotted dog. Knife still in his hand, hardly daring to hope. Timoth unlatched the door and let it swing inward. There, framed by the morning sun, was a big man, taller than even father had been. Over a long green robe, he wore layered gray pelts that accentuated his wide shoulders, and his long golden hair was braided back with beads and bits of bone. He had blue tattoos tracing up his forearms, and in one hand, he held an imposing staff of twisted wood topped with a glittering crystal. In the other hand, he held out a carving, a dog that actually looked like a dog. I got better, he said with a wry smile. A smile that Timoth knew immediately. He threw himself into his brother's arms, and when they pulled out of the hug, Timoth saw the springtime had arrived along with his visitor. The garden was full of green, the trees were unfurling their leaves and buds, and the birds were back, singing in the balls, and true to his word, a large plump stag led dead before Petrock's feet. Did you find the druids? Timoth asked, now breathless with excitement. Petra chuckled and put a hand on his brother's shoulder. I did. Are you... Are, are you a druid now? I am. And so might you be one day, if you wish it. A golden amulet of Petra's chest briefly glowed, and then he was scooping up the heavy deer as if it were nothing heading for the barn. Come, help me clean him, and I'll tell you more. Timoth spent the rest of the day following Petra, asking a million questions. Patrick did his best to answer what he could, although even he couldn't explain why the realm was falling to lawlessness and corruption, and why there were twisted beasts haunting the forest. When Timoth asked him why he'd return, Patrick looked up into the trees overhead and said only, The birds talk. When Timoth asked him what that meant, he stopped what he was doing and looked his younger brother in the eyes. Listen, it's no longer safe for you to go beyond the stone wall, especially not toward the village. Promise me you'll stay within, and I'll take care of the hunting and fishing. Together, we'll see this place flourish again, just as mother and father wished. Do you promise? I... I, I suppose so. Timoth's brow drew down. But I've been going beyond the wall ever since father died. I brought home meat and fish for mother. I'm strong. Why is it dangerous for me, but fine for you? It's dangerous for everyone, Petrock allowed. He pulled back his cloak to show the axe and dagger on his belt, then turned to show the crossbow and quiver on his back. But I've been trained. I... sense things. I know what's out there, and I know how to fight it. He grinned. Aren't younger brothers supposed to be lazy and argue for less chores, not more? Timoth wanted to insist that he was perfectly capable, but... Well, he, he was scared of the world beyond. Just last week he'd found a two-headed baby rabbit dead in the grass. And one time he'd been chased by a horrible thing, all quills and hisses that had scratched at the garden gate after he'd thrown it shut. He couldn't forget Mother's whispered words about the dark seeping in. It was scary up there, but he didn't want Patrock to think he was weak. 
even if he was weak. Living of gruel and cabbage would do that to a lad. That night they dined on roast venison, made tender and succulent with herbs Patrick carried in his barn. Timoth ate until his stomach bulged. He couldn't remember the last time he'd felt full. As they ate, Patrick asked him question after question, trying to fill in all the time he'd lost. Hearing about father, he frowned and leaned back. Hearing about mother, he let loose a single tear. Finally, Patrick stood and yawned, his knuckles scraping at the thatch of the ceiling. You can take the bed, Timoth offered, but Patrick only smiled. I've been sleeping on the ground for years. You take it. When he banged the fire and locked the door, Patrick rearranged his cloak like a blanket and settled in, lying down right there in the entryway. It's warmer by the fire, Timoth said, and now there's a draft. But Petrog didn't move. He played with the knife from his belt, the sharpened metal glinting in the darkness. I've slept in worse places. It took a long time for Timoth to fall asleep. He was glad to see his older brother returned. Overjoyed, really. But he was full of confusing emotions. Guilt that mother had died on his watch. Shame over his father's abandonment. An aching sense of loss to have spent most of his life starving and frightened when the presence of his older brother might have been a bomb. So many good memories they'd never made. And all the while his brother was somewhere far away, learning new things. What are the druids like? Timoth asked. They are everything the legends say, and yet more. Warriors and poet kings. Fierce fighters and spiritual seekers. Rashes drinkers and solemn stoics. They told me it's possible our family is descended from. He chuckled. Well, that's a topic for another day. I traveled a long way to get there, and I reckon I'll sleep like a bear tonight. Good night, Tim. He rolled over, turning to face the door. Tim had thought about what Patrick had said, how he'd describe the druids as a whole, but not as individuals, not as men. He didn't know anything more than before, he'd asked. Patrick was good at that, answering questions in a way that left one with only more questions. Timoth trusted his brother, and yet, he felt a little uneasy around him. But with his full belly and the fire's warmth, sleep soon claimed him despite his doubts. When he awoke the next morning, Patrick was gone, and Timoth momentarily thought it had all been a dream, except that the new dog carving was beside him on the pillow and some cold venison was laid out on the table for him, along with a little crest of fresh water from the well. The door was unlocked, but when he poked his head outside, he didn't see Patra. The sun was still shining, and spring ran riot over the yard and garden. Everything was bright green, flowers already heavy-headed, and blossoms dripping from the trees. Timoth had only planted the carrots, potatoes, and onions a few days ago, and yet their tops were verdant and knee tall. He heard whistling, and Petrock pushed through the wooden gate in the stone wall, carrying a fish as long as his arm. You kept the fish traps well, little brother, he called. Even with this found fellow thrashing about the trap help, Timoth gawped at the fish. I haven't seen one that big in my entire life, he said. Not even when father would fish with worms. Petrock just shrugged. They migrate to spawn. It's just that time of year. But it bothered Timoth a bit. The Patrick had such luck about him. Is it druid magic? Timoth asked. First the stag, now the fish. Patrick regarded him coldly. Is it magic to know where the best mushrooms grow year after year? Is it magic to select the best bull to breed with your heifer? I haven't seen a fish longer than my hand in any of those traps in six years. So if you found it in one of my traps, then yes, that feels a bit like magic. Petrock walked into the house and slapped the fish down on the butchered block. Then call it magic if you like. To me, it's just lunch. He picked up the fillet knife, considered it with a frown, and sharpened it on the stone before neatly gutting the fish. The knife had been perfectly sharp, Timmy thought with a ping of resentment. He took pains to keep it that way. Petrock need not have found fault with it. It was like he was trying to show his superiority. Timoth swallowed a rather unkind thought at the appearance of the succulent Chris metal. But there were many such instances as the brothers learned to coexist. 
They would go out to the garden, and Timothy would pull up a spindly turnip while Patrock pulled up one the size of the cat's head. Timothy would notice that the wood pile was dwindling, and make plans to fetch wood the next day, only to awaken to the sound of Patrock splitting logs in one chop with what had to be a battle axe. Patrock offered to teach him how to use the crossbow, but Patrock's shots always struck the bull's eye, while Timothy's shots frequently went wide. Each time it happened, Patrock was smiling, kind, eager to explain things, and each time Timothy would resent him a little more because he had done just fine on his own before his big brother had resurfaced. Hadn't he? If not, he wouldn't be alive. Perhaps the druids did things better with some sort of secret invisible magic. But there was nothing wrong with the way Timoth carried on day to day, as Patrick spun tales of trees the size of mountains and conversing with eagles. Timoth had to actively refrain from rolling his eyes. Instead, his thoughts rode to the winds of distrust, and his heart began to turn. Patrick was his brother, but he was strange, and for all his endless words, he never really seemed to say anything real, anything about himself. One night, Timoth woke with a full bladder to find Patrick missing from his place before the door, his weapons left behind, leaning neatly against the wall. Across the room, the door was noticeably unlocked. The wood was cold against Timoth's hand as he pulled the door open just enough to see the midnight world beyond. The gibbous moon lit the softly swaying branches and flowers, limning the old stone wall in clear, cold blue. Movement caught Timoth's eye, and he saw Patrick pull open the garden gate and pass beyond. In his hand, he held his twisted staff, and the crystal set in his clutches glowed in a sinister shade of green. Patrick silently closed the garden gate and Timoth lost sight of him. He shut the door and sat on the bed, his mind reeling. What was Patrick doing? Should Timoth follow him out into the forest? But no, he was dangerous out there, and if Patrick didn't know it, he'd soon find out. Timoth waited all night, his fingers curled around the fish knife under his pillow, his eyes trained on the unlocked door. He must have fallen asleep at some point, or perhaps... He dreamt it, because when he woke at dawn, Patrick was back asleep on the floor, snoring. A hundred times that day he opened his mouth to ask Patrick about the midnight wandering he'd witnessed, and a hundred times his mouth snapped shut. If Patrick was doing something bad, something evil out in the corrupted woods, then it's not like he was going to tell the truth anyway. The next night, Timoth feigned sleep. And he again bore witness as Patrick rose with nimble silence, glanced toward the door, and left. After counting to ten, Timoth crept to the door and watched him slip through the gate. The next morning, Patrick was asleep on the floor, a brace of hairs hanging from the ceiling. Patrick promised to make him a warm hat for the winter. Timoth ate his stew and tried to smile, but inside he was shriveling up like a snail in salt. Even if he pretended to be a good, caring brother, Patrick was lying to him, or at the very least, doing something he shouldn't. On the next night, Timoth waited until Patrick was outside, then silently rose from his bed, took up his brother's abandoned crossbow and followed. Once Patrick was out the gate, Timoth scurried in his wake, following the bobbing green light of that strange, twisted staff which was surely not the work of the holy druids. Patrick must have been corrupted, just like the land. The dark must have seeped into him. Timoth had to know for sure. Oddly, Patrick followed the old, overgrown trail up the hill toward the village, right where he, and their mother before him, had made Timoth promise he would never go. Timoth kept to the trees, darting from shadow to shadow as he followed. Once Patrick was over the hill, he disappeared, and Timoth heard to catch up. But then he heard a horrible din, a scream, and a growl, and a wet, ripping sound. And as he crested the hill, he found something his mind struggled to understand. A great beast, like a shaggy grey wolf standing on two legs, reared up over a man who cowered in fear. Another figure lay on the ground sickly still and splattered in blood that shone black in the moonlight. No! P -p please! The cowering man screamed. 
but the wolf thing raised its wicked claws and slashed out the man's throat in a great gush of blood. The body fell to the ground by its fellow, and the wolf thing bent over them, sniffing intently, jaws open. The first man on the ground, was it Patrick? There was his clothes, lying on the overgrown path, so surely it must be. His brother splayed lifeless on the ground. Timoth, alone and forsaken yet again, hand shaking, heart yammering, Timoth held up the crossbow, trying to remember everything Patrog had taught him, but it wasn't quite close enough, and so he hurried forward, the crossbow held before him, until he knew he would hit his mark. Squinting through one eye, he took aim. As if sensing his resolve, the wolf thing's snout spun toward him, its evil glowing eyes locking onto his, flying wide as it recognized his peril. This is for Patrick, Timoth said, and he released the bolt. Timoth reeled with the force of the shot, but the beast's surprised squeal told him he'd found his mark. The bolt stuck out of his foul, muscular chest, a black stain spreading through the long gray fur. Whimpering, the monster stumbled and fell to all fours like the wolf so it resembled. Its eyes again met Timoth's, soulful and sad. There was something about that gaze that struck Timoth, though he couldn't place it. As it looked up at the clear sky and loosed a weird, tortured howl that sent the night birds shrieking from the trees. As Timoth watched, the creature fell to its side on the path and curled up, shrinking into itself. Its fur fell away like wheat under a scythe, revealing smooth alabaster skin trays with blue tattoos. Its snout shrank until its face was no longer so monstrous, and a glowing amulet appeared on its chest. There in the moonlight lay Patrop, the bolt lodged into his heart. Timoth ran to his brother and knelt beside him. Brother, is that you? But how? What? Do, do it, do it, magic, Patrick whispered. These thieves were on the way to the cottage. They would have killed you. I, I told you I, I would always look out for you. You, 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 you kept sneaking away at midnight. And you had a string staff. I thought you were corrupted, Timoth wailed. Only as the wolf could I hunt for you and, and protect you. I wasn't ready to show you yet, Patrick chuckled. The blood burbled out of the side of his mouth. Didn't want to scare you. Patrick pulled his golden amulet over his head and motioned Timoth near. Take this to the druids of Tul Dalra. They will show you. They will... The amulet landed heavy around Timoth's neck as Patrick fell back, his eyes empty. Timoth stood, his fingers wrapped around the heavy stone, the metal chain still warm from Patrick's body. Looking down, he could see in this man the boy he'd once loved above all else. But Patrick, the man that kept things from him. He could change into this terrifying monster, could rip up the man's throat with one careless slash of his talons. How did Patrick know these men were evil, that they were on their way to the cottage? Maybe Patrick took the disguise of the wolf to rob unsuspecting travelers. How else could he possess the gold and gem of this very amulet? A noise in the wood startled Timoth, and he grabbed the crossbow and ran toward the cottage as if being pursued by another wolfman. He burst through the wooden gate, pounded up to the house, threw himself inside and locked the door. He was panting as he reloaded the crossbow and stoked the fire. Tonight he would not sleep. The world had shown him exactly what lay beyond the stone wall. And he wanted nothing of it. The next morning, once dawn was fully established, Timoth opened the door to a confusing sight. The garden sagged, the plants brown and limp, the ground was covered in spent blossoms, the trees skeletal and rattling. He took up the crossbow and scurried along the path toward the village, no longer heeding the cautioning words of his mother and brother. When he crested the hill, he found Patrick's cloak and staff gone, his body nothing but gnawed bones, tangled up with the skeletons of the other two men as if animals had fought over them. He remembered in that moment how his brother's last words had been kind, loving and understanding, free of blame or anger. 
just like the Patroch he remembered from his early days, patient and noble to the last. The amulet under his shirt glowed warm as if in agreement. It was like a bolt to his own heart, realizing that he'd been wrong. The darkness had not found Patroch. Timoth had. Tears sprang up in Timoth's eyes. For all that he felt, his heart must be made of dust. When he looked down the hill at the village, he was shocked to see that it had been totally abandoned and was being subsumed by vines and grasses. There was no hope to be found there. There was no hope to be found anywhere. Timoth ran home as fast as his leg would carry him. He slammed the garden gate and shut and locked the door to the house. He was almost out of firewood and the venison wouldn't last much longer. That night, he sat alone in the scant warmth of a single log, one of the last shot by Patrick. As he fiddled with the two wooden dogs, one so clumsy and the other so accomplished, he heard something scratching at the door. He would not go to Teodora with the amulet and seek out the druids, as his brother had asked with his dying breath. He would not go anywhere at all. He would not go outside, never again. Yet more dark might seep in.